It's fantastic to be in Marrakesh today. I mean, I was, um, uh, I found myself lucky on Monday because the spring had finally arrived in Paris. But here we are in the middle of the summer. So I suppose that I will come back to Paris with a bit of disappointment tomorrow. Um, so the labor market is going through a number of transformation and, and Luc Korteberg uh, just explained to us many of them. So what I would like, uh, and it's important to, to mention that these transformations have an impact on people, on companies, but also on the policies that we implement and on the role of employment services as well. So I will take you through some of these challenges and, and, and share with you some of the lessons that the OECD is drawing in terms of how to address them. And um, I hope my presentation will make clear to you that even though all your employment services can be accessible on this smartphone, and this is just the BlackBerry, there is a growing need for more active and more proactive employment services on the ground today in the new world of work. So I think we all agree that I come back. So the use of technology is in the workplace is increasing dramatically. We can look at this from various angles. This is or maybe it's you see you see it on the on the both sides. This is the amount of ICT capital services per hour worked. So basically, it looks at how much money companies are spending on software and hardware uh, for each working hour in the company. And this amount has doubled or tripled or quintupled, depending on the country you're looking at over the past 15 years or so. We can also look at the number of robots. And on the left-hand side, you see the, every year the additional number of robots that companies are putting in the workplace. And this amount has been tripling over the past, um, let's say, uh, 10 years. And we are expecting it to grow further. The cost of robots is also going down very rapidly. So five years ago in China, the, um, it took five years to pay back, in terms of salary, the cost of replacing a worker by a robot. Last year, this was one and a half year of salary. And by 2020, it will be less than a year of salary. And this explains why the number of robots per each worker is probably doubling or tripling, as you can see on the right-hand side graph. At the same time, the gig economy or the platform economy is creating many new jobs. And this is having an impact also on the average working conditions of workers, as you know, because sometimes these jobs are a bit precarious. So the technolo technological revolution is um, having a big impact. It is really a technological revolution, as we've heard this morning. Will it have an impact on jobs? Of course it will. So Luke mentioned some of the figures. You probably have heard about also the, uh, the estimates of 50% of jobs to be destroyed over the next 15 to 20 years by Frey and Osborne. So at the OECD, we are a bit more conservative on these aspects. And we estimate that perhaps 15% of all jobs will be uh, suppressed over the next 15 to 20 years. However, a lot more jobs, a lot more jobs will change massively because it's not jobs that you automate most of the time. It is some of the tasks. And so it is the job composition that will change. So if you will, it's the job description that you have in professions and, and, and career uh, that you have in, in your countries. However, the impact of automation may be different across the regions in your country. So you may be a country where the risk of automation will be fairly low because the economy is, is quite productive. But there may be regions in your country where the risk will be higher because the main sectors there represented in these regions are less productive. So you have here a range of the difference of what may be uh, expected in some uh, OECD countries. 
So the main impact, for us, the main impact from the technological revolution is the job polarization. So the job polarization. Job polarization is not new, but it has been expanding over the last couple of years. So what you see is a reduction in the demand for middle-skilled workers who are more at risk of automation. At the same time, you have a fairly steep increase in the demand for high-skilled workers. And you have also, in many countries, uh, an increasing demand for low-skilled workers or uh, proximity jobs or people working in services mainly. So for us, this is the main impact we have to deal with. And it brings three key challenges. First, how do we supply the skills in the new world of work? Second, how do we balance the labor market by shifting from one, skills, one category of skills to the other one? And thirdly, are we making the right use of skills in order to increase productivity and salaries and working conditions? So first, the type of skills or the supply of skills. So our education and skill system is struggling in most of our countries to supply the skills that the economy needs. Today, labor market want workers with a good mix of cognitive skills, so knowing to do things in, in the area of work, soft skills, communication, and so on, to be complemented by IT skills. And yet, this is not happening. The study of adult skills that we have done at the OECD shows that on average, 60% of the working age population has poor IT skills, or more precisely, problem-solving skills in technology-rich technology environments, 60%. 23% of the working age population, on average, in OECD countries, has poor numeracy skills, and 20% has poor literacy skills. So by failing to supply the skills that the labor market wants today, we are holding back economic growth and job creation and, and creation of good quality jobs also. So this, is, so this is something that we need to address. So how do we address it? Oh, and maybe I should just mention before that it is a reason why firms are complaining, of course. Employers often complain about the fact that we are not supplying the right job, sometimes for good reasons, sometimes for not, for not good reasons. But the reality is that today, 35% across the OECD report difficulties in filling uh, jobs. So what can we do about it? Well, first of all, we need to make our education and skill system more responsive. Obviously, there's little we can do here. It's mainly the education system. However, there's a lot we can do from the employment service perspective, when we think of it also with training. There's a lot we can do on training for the young people, training for the, for the unemployed, training in firms. It's important to be able to, uh, not to take a one-size-fits-all approach and to provide adapted solutions to the reality that we find at the local level and to identify what the skills gaps are. It's very important to have flexibility in the management of employment programs and skills program so that we can provide those innovative responses. And to do this, strong partnerships with uh, the economic development stakeholders is key, notably in putting together the labor market intelligence that we produce with the economic intelligence that economic stakeholders produce. When you put the two together, it's often easier to see what are the skills gaps that the local sectors and the em emerging sectors are facing uh, in our economies. So, and then it's important to be able to influence the skill system in this way. So it's not ideal, but there's a lot of things we can do. In terms of having a, a flexible management of employment programs across the OECD, we see a lot of differences, and this is very much a very important condition. So here we try to measure the degree of flexibility in the management of employment programs at the local level, sub-regional level. And we take into account how budgets are managed, programs are, uh, the mix of programs is decided, if uh, eligibility criteria can be modified, for example, at the local level. 
And we see that in large countries, federations like Germany or small countries like Denmark, you have a lot of that flexibility which allows to coordinate labor market programs with economic development, for example, at the local level. But also you have small countries like Greece, like the Slovak Republic, or, or federations also like Australia, where you have less flexibility because the model is different. In Australia, they prefer to manage a, a contract with the private service providers managed from uh, the central level. So it has some advantages, but also some disadvantages. I'll stop on, on this in terms of, of this element, but I think it's very important. So the second challenge, I talked to you about the polarization with the degrees in the demand for middle-skilled workers. Well, you have an increase in high-skilled workers and an increase in low-skilled workers. So we need to balance the labor market by helping the middle-skilled workers to acquire the skills that they would need in order to get better quality jobs. But we are failing to do that. And the danger is that if the middle-skilled workers cannot access those better jobs, they will compete with the low-skilled workers for the low-paid jobs. So not only they're getting a lower salary, but they're contributing to dampen further overall salaries because they are crowding out the market for low-paid jobs. And this is probably why today we are not seeing so much inflation in our economies. So what can we do about this? Well, fortunately or unfortunately, we can rely, we can draw on the experience that we've built over the years in how to upgrade the skills of the low-skilled workers, because this has been the priority since the year 2000. And we need to continue to upgrade the skills of the low-skilled workers. These are those who benefit the least from vocational training. But we can really use what we've identified in terms of what works well and what doesn't work well to provide lessons for um, helping the middle-skilled workers to acquire more skills. First of all, we need to make sure that the, the training is flexible in terms of modular training, part-time, and so on, as well as now using e-learning methods. We also need to engage employers and employees and helping them to identify what they can gain from additional training. And this is very important. If they know what is to gain, they will contribute they will, um, um, they will more easily make a decision to invest with their own time and with their own money. And so many countries have tried with tests which can be used for employers and employees to, to assess what is it that they can gain from additional uh, 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 training. We can use intermediaries for doing that between training providers and employers. And this can be a role of employment services, for example. And we need also to, of course, pool SME needs and work more specifically with the SMEs which have less capacities to undertake training. And now I'll come to my last challenge, which is the most difficult one. So even if we were able to supply the right skills that the economy needs, even if we were able to balance the labor market and upgrade the skills of the middle-skilled workers, we probably would not be able to increase living standards significantly. If we want to increase living standards, we need to increase salaries. If we want to increase salaries, we need to increase productivity. One of the best ways to increase productivity is to make full use of the talent that is available in the companies. And this is not happening. From our OECD study on adult skills, we see that a significant share of the skills of people is not properly used in the workplace, whether it is developing countries or developed countries. And this is one of the reasons also why we have so much overqualification in countries like uh, Morocco, for example. So it's really a situation which address all countries. Countries which want to escape the middle, skill, middle skills trap need to focus on how skills are used in companies. And the relationship between skills utilization and productivity is clear. Here we're looking at the use of reading skills, not how we read or uh, if we have learned to read in schools. If we apply reading in the workplace, it has a relationship with productivity. So it's important not only to invest in the supply of skills, which is essential, we also need to make sure that the skills is, better, is used by the companies. So not only investing on the supply, which is the horizontal axis, but also making sure they are used and demanded by companies. And in this way, you can reach a high skill equilibrium where you create a, a great proportion of good quality 
jobs. So how do we do that very quickly? And this is a role that employment services can play. It's important to be able to spot the high turnover companies because a high turnover may be a signal that something is going wrong in the company. So instead of repeatedly filling this, this gap in the same company, it may be better and more efficient in terms of using public monies to work with other stakeholders and to try to identify what is the problem in this company. In many countries in, in Europe or in America, you know, unemployment is going down. It's not a question of you know, filling more people. It's a question of better using the talent that we have. So we can develop human resource development services, workforce planning services. We can share the files on firms with other providers so that we don't work in silos. And this is a good opportunity for partnership between private employment services and public employment services. We can work likewise with economic development agencies and chambers of commerce and work with consultants for the more complex case. And at the same time, building partnerships, bringing together of course, the economic stakeholders, but also going to see the universities and the training institutions so that they can do more in terms of helping the small firms sometimes, doing applied research, being more involved with local SMEs. And so I'd like to leave you with this. I hope I've been able to convince you that today, employment services should, they can, but they should also play a more meaningful role, a more active role, they can, be, uh, they can play a role of leader in more um, flexible employment services where you have this freedom to coordinate with economic development, with skills development, it will be easier to partner with skills partners to, um, uh, in practice, uh, deliver results on lifelong learning, so upgrading the skills of the low qualified workers and the middle skilled workers, and likewise, to partner with economic development stakeholders and engage employers in making a better use of talent, which will increase productivity, raise salaries, and living conditions. Thank you very much for your attention.